She was a stunning single mom. She's beautiful. And that was my first thought when I saw her. He was a handsome man in uniform. I can see why the ladies might be attracted to him. They would have been a perfect match if it wasn't for a perfect rival. They were the power couple. They were like the prominent black upcoming couple. She was crazy about him. I mean, everybody knew it. Would the two-timing ladies man ever make a decision? Or would someone make it for him? It was unreal. It was like a movie of the week. And as the plot thickened, it was left to investigators to separate the truth from the sex, lies, and audio tape. No, you know I didn't do anything. You need to tell the truth. Man, I ain't going to jail. And I'm supposed to decide I didn't do? You gonna kill me too? January 4th, 2007. A call came in to a Durham, North Carolina 911 center just after 10 a.m. Durham 911, where's your emergency? The caller was a tenant at an apartment complex near the campus of North Carolina Central University. Someone was leaving the apartment. As he was coming down the steps, he knows someone was laying at the bottom of the steps. He went and called 911. I just walked out of my apartment. He's at the bottom of the stairs, head busted up and blood everywhere. Is she conscious? Hey, baby girl. Hello? You know, a lot of college kids live in this complex. So he didn't really think it strange to find somebody at the bottom of the steps. He figured the person was asleep. When she didn't respond, the caller tried a different tack. Do you want me to get her idea? He was going through her wallet to try to identify who, who this woman was laying on the floor. Her name is Janita Monique Smith. A grad student who had spent six years at NCCU, Danita's name was well known on the college's Durham campus. Danita Smith was very, very popular, very pretty girl, seemed to have everything in the world going for her. Danita may have had everything in the world going for her, but that afternoon, it would all go terribly wrong. I really appreciate you calling in for her, and we do have help on the way over there. Working at a 911 center, Shannon Crawley was used to handling traumatic calls like the one from the apartment complex that day. She was actually a 911 dispatcher at the time, which is obviously quite an important job in that community. But she didn't take that particular call. In fact, she couldn't have. Not only had she taken the morning off, she worked 60 miles away in Greensboro. Shannon Crawley was a dispatcher for the Guilford County 911. A single mother of two, Shannon had taken the job to support her family. The father was in California. They hadn't been together in some time. Busy juggling two kids and a demanding job, Shannon wasn't exactly looking for a new man in her life. But that changed in 2004 when a handsome young cadet named Jermere Jackson Stroud joined the Greensboro Police Force. Jermere was a Greensboro police officer, so he had to have contact with 911 telecommunicators on a regular basis. And Jermere and Shannon met in a training course. Jermere and Shannon spent hours role-playing mock police calls. And by the time the course was over, the officer obviously wanted to stay connected to the pretty dispatcher. He asked for her phone number and she gave it to him. The intention was that they they were going to be friends, keep in touch. But soon, Shannon and Jermere were acting like more than just friends. They talked, becoming close friends, and then in September, I believe it was, a relationship turned physical. It wasn't exactly romantic, however. It looked like a relationship of convenience. Friends with benefits is probably a good way to describe it. In fact, rather than a couple embarking on a brand new relationship, Shannon and Jermere acted as if they'd been together for years. I never once heard discussion of a date that they went on, you know, like he, that he planned something that was really fun or, you know, took her out to dinner or bought her flowers or anything like that. It was more like, well, I've got today off, you've got today off, you know, let's help each other do the laundry or, you know, go shopping. But only a few months after meeting Jameer, Shannon's casual relationship suddenly turned serious. 
Somewhere around the end of 2005, she became pregnant. Jermere and Shannon seemed to have the comfortable relationship of a married couple. But instead of prodding them into making it official, the pregnancy paved the way for a different sort of turning point. In January of 2006, her and Jameer agreed that they were going to have an abortion. The decision to end the pregnancy proved difficult for Shannon, as did the decision that followed. That was kind of the end of their mutual dating relationship. It may have been the end of their dating relationship, but the couple remained friends. They both still cared for each other. He would have a bad day at work or something like that. Something would go really bad for him. And he didn't think he couldn't think of anyone else to call. He would call her. She was having a particularly bad day or something like that. She would call him. And even though they had not been intimate, when she needs an ear to listen to and she, she calls him, he answers and they talk. Would they ever do more than talk? There were certainly signs that Shannon wanted to rekindle their old relationship of convenience. She started coming to his church. She actually ended up eventually buying a home in his neighborhood. Every time he had a problem, he would call her and they'd have those long conversations on the phone. That was her way back in. Anyone that's been in a relationship knows that they always don't end on day one. They, you know, they end and then they start up again. Would Shannon's moment ever come? One thing was certain, at the end of 2006, a huge problem was heading Jameer Stroud's way. Sunday, December 24th, 2006. It was supposed to be a special Christmas Eve service, but for Shannon Crawley, it would prove to be an epiphany. She'd barely settled into a back pew that morning when Jermere Stroud had walked into the sanctuary. And he walked in with a pretty young woman on his arm. They showed up for church one day, and Shannon Crowley saw them at church together. Her name was Danita Smith, and she and Jermere were by no means a new item. Danita had started dating Jameer long before he had met Shannon. Six years, in fact. They had been together since college. Jameer and Danita met on um, the campus of North Carolina Central University. They were part of the sound machine, which is the marching band at NCCU. They met, I think, in 2000, and they started dating pretty quickly after they met. It hadn't been long before Jameer and Danita were one of the most prominent couples on campus. I mean, they had like Michelle and Barack Obama potential, definitely. They were the power couple. Jameer had certainly fit the bill. He was in Alpha Phi Alpha, very business oriented, very smart, good grades, also very professional, well put together. But if Jameer had potential, Danita's potential seemed unlimited. Danita was one of the most ambitious people that you've ever met. She was always on the go. She always looked good, <laughs> always dressed very tastefully. Very pretty girl, seemed to have everything in the world going for her. She had interest in journalism. She got very serious about her photography right away. And um, within a, a year or so, she was really a top-notch photographer. During her undergrad years, Danita's hard work on the student newspaper had even earned her a fellowship with the New York Times. Danita was very excited to be selected to be part of the New York Times Student Journalism Institute. She was, I think, the second person from North Carolina Central to, to attend. After graduation, Danita had stayed in Durham, working toward her master's at NCCU, while her boyfriend had moved to Greensboro. He went off to become a police officer, and they continued to date while he was working. Danita talked about Jameer all the time, how he was coming to visit one weekend or she was going out to visit him. The long distance relationship may have been tough, but once in Greensboro, Jameer had found a way to cope. Shannon. Neither of the two women knew about each other. You talk about guys being smooth and smooth operators and all that kind of stuff, I, I guess he was, you know, because somehow he was able to pull this off. The 60 miles separating his two girlfriends had helped, which was a good thing if Jameer expected to keep Danita in the picture. If she thought Jameer was cheating on her, she definitely would have put a stop to that. She would have dropped it right then and there. She had too much pride. She was too driven and didn't have time for that nonsense or the drama and wouldn't have anything to do with it. She was better than that. 
Was that why Dramir had broken things off with Shannon nearly a year earlier? Was he afraid Danita would find out? Of the two women, he had certainly seemed more serious about Danita. Jameer was head over heels for Danita. She was head over heels. They made a really good couple. That's why it had come as no surprise to Danita's friends when Jameer proposed to her in November of 2006. They were very much in love, very excited to get married. Danita had been especially excited. She showed that ring everywhere. <laughs> Um, she kind of always did this and the <laughs> to make sure that she noticed the ring, but she was very, very proud. But did Shannon notice the engagement ring on Danita's finger when she and Jameer walked into church on Christmas Eve? No one knows for sure. But one thing was certain, the short trip to their seats that Sunday morning was the closest Danita and Jameer would ever come to a trip down the aisle. January 4th, 2007, a week and a half since Danita Smith had walked into church on Jameer Stroud's arm. She was 60 miles away in Durham, back at her apartment near campus. It was school vacation. People had gone home to see, visit their families, but nobody was really around at the time. There were really only three or four people that still remained there over the holidays. But the campus wouldn't remain quiet for long. Police rushed to the complex, and as responding officers secured the scene, they were given an important clue. This had not been the first call from the apartment complex that day. The call came in that there had been a gunshot. On January 4th, 2007, Durham 911 received a call from a North Carolina Central University student apartment complex. A tenant at the complex had just found a young woman named Danita Smith collapsed at the bottom of a flight of stairs. Shortly after 10 o'clock, um, someone was leaving the apartment. He knows someone was laying at the bottom of the steps. He sees her on the steps. She doesn't appear to be conscious, so he calls 911. Police and EMTs rushed to the scene, but by the time the ambulance arrived, it was much too late. She doesn't respond. She's dead. But how had she died? The man who found the body thought Danita had simply fallen down the stairs. Well, he thought that the girl had tripped and fallen, and so he called 911 to get someone to help her out. At first glance, the evidence at the scene appeared to confirm the caller's hunch like a shoe here and a shoe there and a water bottle and her purse. It was obvious that whatever had happened to Danita, it happened at the top of the staircase. But had she simply tumbled down the stairs? It didn't take detectives long to figure out there was more to the story. That's because Danita's neighbor had not been the first person to call 911 from the apartment complex that morning. A call had come in from the maintenance man more than an hour earlier. Officers had responded to that call, but failed to find any evidence of shots fired. That is, until they turned over Danita's body. Processing the victim's body, we noticed that she had a gunshot wound to the head. At the briefing, we were um, actually informed about the 819 shots fired call. And obviously when, when Danita was found and pretty much determined that the two were probably one incident. If that were the case, the maintenance man clearly heard the shot. Homicide detectives wasted no time taking his statement. At 8.19 in the morning, he's just pretty much killing time, smoking a cigarette, and he hears a bang. He got in his truck and actually drove toward where he thought the noise was coming from. That's when he saw a young woman shaking and in tears. He saw a black female walking kind of fast and had her hands over her mouth. As the young woman got into a burgundy SUV, the maintenance man pulled alongside. He asks her, ma'am, are you okay? Because she's kind of shaking this and uh, looks a little distraught. And she shakes her head, no. He says, Do you, did you hear a shot? And he, she shakes her head, yes. Boo-hoo crying. That is how he described it. She was very distraught, extremely upset, said she'd heard the gunfire and was trying to make sense out of what happened. Then the young woman drove off as the maintenance man dialed 911. 
Police responded to the shots fired call, but found nothing out of the ordinary and no trace of the shaken young woman. Officers responded and circled around, spoke with the complainant, and um, they were able to come up with nothing. So um, they, they left the scene and cleared the call. Was the shaken young woman the maintenance man saw a witness? Or was it possible the woman in the Burgundy Ford Explorer was the shooter? Police would have to dig for more answers. And Danita's body offered one potentially crucial clue. Her killer had struck with deadly precision. To, you know, make that shot dead center on the back of the head. One typically thinks good marksman. I mean, it's hard to hit someone in the back of the head um, with a single gunshot. While crime scene specialists processed the evidence, detectives started contacting Danita's family, friends, and fiance. Soon, a small, distraught crowd had gathered at the apartment complex. The family of Danita Smith was called. Everybody is on the scene. Everybody is upset. Um, Danita Smith's fiance, Jermere Stroud, was called. Um, Stroud, of course, came to the scene. And had Jermere known, he might have had extra reason to be emotional. Police were already wondering, was he the marksman who'd killed Danita with a single shot? Finding that, that uh, her fiance, um, you know, is a law enforcement officer. Rose an eyebrow. Naturally, yes, of, of course, uh, Jameer Stroud, he, he did come to mind. But by the time investigators were finished processing the scene the next day, Jameer was on his way home to Greensboro. Durham police would have to speak with him over the phone. We start to ask Jameer, um, you know, look, see how forthcoming he was with any information. Where were you and what was your work schedule and that kind of thing? Jameer readily answered the questions, although his responses were a little vague. Jameer said on the morning of the murder, actually he was at home in bed because he had just worked the night before. Then the cop followed up and said, do you, uh, do you know anybody who drives a Burgundy Ford Explorer? His exact words were, oh my God. Jameer not only knew a woman with a Burgundy Explorer, he gave the detectives her name. Mr. Stroud came up with, oh, well, Shannon Crawley had this, you know, female that I know drives a burgundy SUV. What's more, according to Jermere, Shannon had been stalking him. The initial story that was coming out is that, you know, he didn't really know her that well, but he, she had been stalking him and I guess maybe somewhat obsessed with him. Was Shannon's supposed stalking somehow connected to Danita's murder? Jermere apparently thought so, and he appeared equally anxious to tell the police all about it. At that point, Jermere turned the car back around, came and gave us information leading to Shannon Crawley. What he said behind closed doors that afternoon changed the whole dynamic of the investigation. Shannon wasn't just his alleged stalker. She had also been his lover. He and Miss Crawley had been involved in a romantic relationship. Jameer said that he'd stopped seeing Shannon a year earlier, but he also claimed she had had trouble letting go. He said, when she first joined my church, it's no big deal. A lot of people joined that church. When she first moved into my neighborhood, no big deal. A lot of people moved in that neighborhood. He said there were all kinds of red flags that you can look back now and see. Or was Jameer the one waving a red flag, offering Shannon as an attractive suspect in his place? After all, his alibi about being home in bed when the murder occurred was awfully thin. I could tell you I was in bed, and you could say you were in bed. We could not prove that. The investigators could check out Jameer's story about Shannon, however. That evening, Durham police made the hour trip to the Guilford County 911 Center. They went to Greensboro to question Shannon Crawley about the crime. They just wanted to hear from her, get her side of the story. She was asked if she heard about what happened. She stated she did hear what happened. Shannon went on to explain that she had been at work for most of the previous day, except for that morning when she was at home with a sick child. She said that she decided not to take her child to the doctor's appointment, so she called for a babysitter, and then she decided to go into work later on. Then, when the conversation turned to Jermere Stroud, Shannon told police that it was true that they had dated.
but she also said that at the moment, they were merely friends. I asked her, did she think uh, Jameer was, was capable of, of killing Danita? And she said no. I asked, are you afraid of Jameer? And she said no. Next, the investigators asked Shannon a few seemingly routine questions. We asked questions like, had you ever been to Durham? She stated that she's been through Durham, but never actually to Durham for a specific reason. Then, they asked Shannon if she owned a gun. She said no, she's never owned a gun, she, she's just afraid of guns. But given that kind of information and how forthcoming she was with everything else, I, I had really no reason to doubt anything at that point. The investigators did need to corroborate Shannon's statement, however. On January 6th, working with the Greensboro Police Department, they executed a search warrant on Shannon's Explorer. And what they found suddenly gave Durham police reason to doubt everything she'd told them. The police and forensics found there was a gun powder residue on the steering wheel of the car. Had Shannon lied to police? The suspicion was confirmed when another witness came forward. She had a co-worker that came up and said, so I want to tell you that I sold Shannon Crawley a gun. In a written statement, the co-worker said he had sold Shannon a 38 revolver a couple months before the shooting. There's nothing wrong with buying a gun. The transaction was perfectly legal, but my point is why I lie about it. Was Shannon trying to protect someone? Hoping for answers, police subpoenaed both Shannon's and Jameer's cell phone records. The logs appeared to confirm that Jameer was in Greensboro the day of the murder, but not Shannon. She was in Durham the day of the offense and extremely close to the address of uh, the victim's apartment complex. Between the co-worker's story about the gun and the phone records, the police had proof that Shannon had lied to them at least twice, giving them more than enough probable cause for an arrest. On January 9th, Durham police tracked Shannon to her sister's house in Greensboro. Her children were crying. Her family was crying. She came out with no emotion. She came out like she was checking the mail. Later that evening at the Durham police station, Shannon still did not appear worried. Miss Crawley's mugshot, which actually was th the first time that I saw her likeness, she was smiling in her mugshot. On January 9th, 2007, it had been less than a week since Danita Smith was murdered outside her apartment. But Durham police had already made an arrest. Shannon Crawley not only matched a witness's description of a woman fleeing the scene, she had once dated Danita's fiance, Greensboro police officer Jameer Stroud. Information rolls out and you immediately start putting two and two together and going, oh my God, this is a jealousy thing. It was definitely rumors as to why a woman would be so enraged that she had to shoot another woman. A memorial service for Danita was held on North Carolina Central's campus. At the service, Danita was given a posthumous honor. They named the newsroom after her at the Campus Echo. And I think that meant a lot to the family. It was, it was just symbolic things that help you, you know, accept that, that, that loss. But soon, the room named in Danita Smith's honor would be abuzz with news about her murder investigation. But this time, it would be Shannon Crawley making headlines and accusations. On May 30th, just three weeks after she'd been released on $175,000 bond, Shannon walked into the Durham Police Department with her attorney. She wanted to explain some of the evidence that had come out. She told police Jermir was the one doing the stalking in their relationship, not her. He would continuously call me on my cell phone at work. It would interrupt the radio. He would come in communications and stand in the hallway and stare at me. Shannon said that it was Jermir's odd behavior at the 911 center that had prompted the co-worker to offer her the gun for protection. I decided then it may be a good idea to have something to protect myself because he always has his gun with him. And there wouldn't be anything I could do if he tried to hurt me or my children. At this point, she did acknowledge the fact that, yeah, she had the weapon. But she also claimed she had immediately regretted the decision. She thought that even though she had the gun, she wouldn't be capable of firing it had the circumstances arisen. 
She said that she was very fearful of guns, so she threw that gun away. But why hadn't she told police the truth from the start? Do you still stand by the story that you've never owned again? The gun that I bought from the I had for all of the day I had. But had she thrown it away too soon? According to Shannon, Jermere threatened her with a gun of his own on the morning of January 4th, 2007. Shannon told investigators that Jameer Stroud had come to her home in Greensboro and forced her to get in the car and go with him to Durham. She stated that Jameer lifted up his shirt, showed her with gun, and put his finger over, her, over his mouth, telling her, be quiet. He said, I'll make it real simple. Either your children die or you die for your children. And he knew at that point it wasn't a question. I told him, okay, that was fine. I called into work. I told him that my son had a doctor's appointment and that I would be late. He forces her to go with him. Uh, they pull into the parking lot right in front of Danita's building. He got out, took my keys and my cell phone. He went up the stairs. A few more minutes passed and I heard him arguing, him yelling at someone. Shannon said she decided to try and figure out what was going on. I got out of the car, started up the sidewalk to the breezeway, and I heard a gunshot. Shannon said Jermere had then run back to her car and jumped into the driver's seat. I started to get in the back seat, and the door was locked. And I told him, I can't get in, the door is locked. He got out of the driver's seat by sliding up over the back seat and got into the back seat and just told me to get in. I got in the driver's seat. I started to leave. She had stated that the gunshot residue that uh, was found on the steering wheel of her vehicle was from where he initially jumped into the driver's seat before crawling into the back seat. According to Shannon, Jermere had remained in the back seat as the maintenance man approached in his truck. I stopped at the black truck and the man asked me if I was all right. I said, shook my head no. He said, did you hear a gunshot? I said, yes. She said that Jameer Stroud was actually in the back seat the entire time. He would kick at the chair when I would continue talking to him. You know, I'm trying to glance in the back seat, but still trying to look at him, getting him to realize that he was in the back seat. But the maintenance man never saw Jameer. And when he drove off to search for the source of the shot, Shannon said there was nothing she could do. I watched the truck go up the hill and drive away from me. And I made the left. I went out of the complex, got back on 85, and came back towards Greensboro. On the drive home, Shannon said she had talked to her children, the call that had placed her in Durham that day. She pretty much gave us what happened, but just placing him there. Shannon didn't claim to know why Jermere would want to kill Danita, but maintained he was violent enough to do so. But why hadn't she said so from the beginning? As you get West asked, asked you, do you think Jameer was violent? You said no. I recall saying no. He is violent. And he's been... He's threatened me on numerous, numerous occasions. He knows that I'm afraid of him. He knows what to say. Is that inconsistent? Not really. When you talk to people who deal with domestic violence and, and battered women, um, you know, if they got a thing for the guy, they got a thing for the guy. Love or lust can make you do some, some, some crazy things. And Shannon maintained that her fear of Jameer and his threats to her children had kept her from coming forward. I wasn't going to take a chance of him doing anything to them. He knows where I live. He knows where my family lives. He knows how to find me. He knows my routine. He knows where I am all the time. Could Jermir have set Shannon up to take the fall? After all, Jermir was a cop and would presumably know how to frame a crime. Her story th that she gave in May, some of it was plausible. Plausible or not, Jermir denied everything when questioned by the police. Mr. Stroud continued to maintain his innocence and, you know, basically proclaimed that he was a victim in, the, in all of this. Jermere wasn't the only one claiming to be a victim, however. After making her statement, Shannon certainly acted as if she still feared her ex-boyfriend. Out on bail and awaiting trial, she loaded up the kids and left town. She moved to Charlotte to live with her family. They live in the Charlotte area. 
But the 100 miles she had put between her and Jameer did little to deter the stalking, she claimed. She said that Jameer Stratton was calling all the time, that he was really bothering her. He didn't stop at threatening phone calls, according to Shannon. In June of 2008, a year after she had accused him of murder, Shannon would make another accusation against Jermere. Only this time, she wouldn't make the accusation at the police station. She would make it from a hospital bed. Early on the morning of June 20th, 2008, Shannon Crawley walked into a Charlotte ER and reported she had just been raped. She told police a very vivid story about how she went outside to walk the dog. Her dogs were barking because they heard someone outside. And so she went outside to walk her dogs. And Jameer was there and raped her for three hours. When Shannon Crawley's trial began in February 2010, the proceedings at the Durham County Courthouse had all the makings for a movie of the week. A love triangle that ended in tragic death, dueling murder accusations, and an attractive cast. It was that whole soap opera thing. You know, Shannon Crawley is not bad on the eyes at all. Denise Smith was a beautiful girl. And then you got Jameer Jackson Stroud, very handsome guy. Jermere may have been good looking, but Shannon insisted that he was also violent. More than a year after the murder, she had even accused him of sexual assault. But Charlotte police found no evidence to support Shannon's accusations. Unlike Danita's murder, Jermere had a solid alibi for the alleged assault on Shannon. He was in Greensboro when he was supposed to be raping her at 2.30 in the morning in Charlotte. He has a receipt that he was in Greensboro at McDonald's. And Shannon's attorneys had fought to keep the alleged rape from coming up at her trial. The rape allegation was something that the defense wanted to keep out of the case altogether. But the judge ruled Shannon's charges against Jermere were relevant, which was good news for the prosecutors. It was something that the, the prosecution wanted to get into the trial because they thought it showed a pattern of her trying to hurt Jermere, get back at Jermere. According to prosecutors, Danita's murder was part of the same vindictive pattern. The prosecution's closing argument, um, of course, centered on the fact that Shannon Crawley had killed Danita Smith because she was jealous of Danita's relationship with Jermir Stroud. The defense, in their open, stuck with the argument Shannon had been maintaining for two and a half years. The defense presented this theory that Jameer Stroud was actually the one that killed Danita Smith and that Shannon Crawley was just along for the ride. But Jermir had never been charged in the murder. It really honestly took me a long time to rule him out. It really did. But I've spoken with him several times, several different occasions. Um, and his story has always remained consistent. He's not proud of his story. There's nothing to be proud of but it was always consistent. And on February 11th, Jermere took the stand as the prosecution's star witness. When Jermere Stroud walked in, Shannon Crawley just tensed up. I mean, you could tell he was in the room. She was greatly affected by him walking in. They escorted me and he's you know, looking sharp, looking smooth. Um, I, you know, I could, you know, I could see why the ladies might be attracted to him. In his testimony, Jermere didn't deny being a ladies' man. But he was also adamant that he had put his womanizing behind him once he had broken things off with Shannon. He was asked if he loved Anita Smith, and he said yes, that he very much wanted to, to marry her. On cross-examination, the defense questioned Jermere's sincerity. After all, hadn't he been dating Danita the whole time he was seeing Shannon? There's not a great deal that you could do to, to make him look favorable. I mean, there's nothing great about what he did nothing good at all but it was shannon not jermere who had fired the fatal shot the prosecutors claimed as proof they called shannon's former co-worker to the stand to reiterate what he had told police three years earlier the individual that sold the gun to shannon stated that he sold her a 38 caliber revolver during the investigation shannon had initially denied owning a gun and when caught in that lie, said she'd thrown the 38 away. And although a murder weapon had never been found, on February 15th, prosecutors called the state firearms expert to the stand. In his testimony, 
He revealed a significant detail about the bullet fragments recovered during Danita's autopsy. After receiving the bullet fragment from the medical examiner's office, it was determined that it was a, the bullet was a 38 caliber. Prosecutors had provided Shannon with a motive and connected her to a potential murder weapon. But was it enough to convict the single mother of murder? When her attorney started presenting her defense on February 18th, Shannon appeared confident of an acquittal. It was like she was just here for, you know, paying a tax pay, you know, a bill or something. You would have never have known she was on trial for murder. And she appeared just as confident later that same afternoon when she took the stand in her own defense. She seemed very sure of herself. She was poised. And she was also well rehearsed. Shannon's testimony was almost a mirror image of the story that she gave in, in May of 2007. Just like in 2007, Shannon testified that Jermere had forced her to come along on his road trip to kill Danita. But what about the cell phone records that placed Jermere in Greensboro? According to Shannon, they were part of Jermere's well-orchestrated plan. According to, to her story, he'd be smart. Keep your cell phone away. I mean, he's a police officer. He knows how investigations work. If you didn't have the proof, you might have believed her. She was convincing. If you ignored the facts, she was very convincing. Shannon may have been convincing on the stand, but how was she on tape? During cross-examination, the DA confronted Shannon with a series of tapes they had secured from the defense during discovery. He had it up there on the witness stand, is uh, the boom box. He pressed play and let him play for a while, let the jurors take it in, let him absorb it. Shannon had given the tapes to her attorneys months earlier, claiming they were recordings of threatening phone calls Jermir had made to her. But the defense hadn't used them as part of their case, and the reason was soon obvious. Are you going to kill me too? We all heard Jameer testify and he had a pretty deep voice. And the, whoever this person was on the other end of the phone was, you know, had a high-pitched voice. Folks were like, are, are you kidding me? This, this stuff, this is so fake. You need to tell the truth. And I'm supposed to decide I didn't do? Closing arguments came the next day. The prosecutor touched on a number of the, the different claims that had come up, the rape allegation, also the audio tapes that were made. Does anybody truly believe that that makes any kind of sense, that somebody who did the things that she's saying Jameer did would call and say those kinds of things, and basically just confess and admit to killing Danita? He said specifically to the jury, she is playing you. She is trying to play you. If it sounds too good to be true, if it sounds fabricated, it is. In his closing, Shannon's attorney relied on reasonable doubt, imploring jurors not to send a young mother to jail unless they were absolutely sure that Shannon, not Jermir, was guilty of Danita's murder. I think it all really came down to whether or not the jury believed Jameer. Did they believe he was a good person? Did they believe he could do something like this? Because if they did believe that, then they definitely would not convict her. When it was time for the verdict, you know, word got out and, and the folks from the courtroom, everybody swarmed in and literally standing room only. Three years earlier, Danita Smith had been killed by a single shot to the head. And that afternoon, it only took a single word to take Shannon down. They pronounced her guilty of first-degree murder with malice, deliberation, and perpetration. Looking at Danita's family, there was a collective sigh of relief that the one is finally over, they don't have to worry about this anymore, and two, that she was convicted. Shannon, on the other hand, showed little reaction. She didn't break down and, and fall to pieces. I mean, she shook a little bit, and her head dropped, and she was upset, and her... Her parents were upset. There didn't appear to be a lot of emotion there. I remember the judge asking her if there was anything that she wanted to say, and, and she said no. Shannon elected not to speak, but Danita's family certainly took the opportunity. I hope you rock hell. Because you took something from me. You had no right to do that. She didn't do anything. You shouldn't even know you. And when it came time to sentence Shannon, there was no choice. She received a mandatory sentence of life in prison without parole. 
when the judge told Shannon Crawley, told this 30-year-old woman that she's going to jail for the rest of her life, she had this look on her face, as they say, as, as if she's seen a ghost. But the judge wasn't finished. He also had strong words for Jameer. He said Jameer Jackson Stroud created the perfect storm for all of this to happen. Now, he didn't say that Jameer Stroud planned Anita Smith's murder or forced anybody to pull the trigger, but he created an environment for this type of thing to happen. But while Jameer Stroud once betrayed Danita Smith, Shannon Crawley is the one convicted of her murder. If you put all the emotion aside, cheating is not an uncommon thing. People cheat all the time, nobody gets shot. 